Welcome to the first ever Inside EVs podcast. Today, we'll be talking about the production delay of the Rivian R1T all-electric pickup truck, the Tesla Model Y teardown video series by Monroe and Associates, the Tesla Model S performance increase with its new Cheetah Stance launch mode, and much, much more. Thanks for joining us. Hello and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast, the weekly podcast from Inside EVs. I'm Dominic Chioni. I'm uh, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Uh, this is episode number one. Uh, today we have with us Tom Malogny. He is a longtime EV advocate and an Inside EVs editor. Uh, we also have Martin Lee from the EV Daily News podcast and Kyle Connor from Out of Spec Motoring. A YouTube channel and a contributor now to Inside EVs, uh, Inside EVs as well. Um, so, gentlemen, how are you all doing? Good. Doing fine. Yeah, everything's good. All right. So, we have a bunch of news to, to cover. Uh, so, let's just start, jump right into it. Uh, so, the uh, Rivian R1T electric pickup truck, its launch is now delayed until 2021. Uh, Rivian, for those that don't know, it's a startup. They haven't uh, produced a vehicle yet, but they have this electric pickup truck and the uh, SUV based on the same platform. Um, and they're going to be bu building some vehicles for Ford. And they also have a uh, 100,000 vehicle order with Amazon for a slightly different, like a delivery truck. But anyway, their first product is the R1T electric pickup truck, and it's delayed. What do you think, Martin? It's kind of inevitable. They'd, they'd been quiet for a while and hoping that uh, they would be able to ride this out. But they haven't mentioned the R1S, of course, T for truck and S for SUV. So they said the R1T is delayed. The R1S, you would think that was always going to come after the truck anyway. You would think that is also de facto is going to be delayed as well. And it's a real shame. And it's one of those things that whenever I talk about Rivian on the podcast, gets a huge reaction. Probably haters are going to hate here, probably disproportionately in in favor of compared to what they've actually done for a company that's been around for, what, 10 years now or, or maybe not that, quite so long, and they've, they've just hit their stride. But whenever I talk about them, it gets a huge reaction. I don't know how you guys find on on you know, on the website or the, the, the comments. There's so much love for them. They've not actually made anything. Is that unfair? No, I mean they, they, they made a quite a splash when they debuted the truck and the uh, and the SUV at the uh, LA Auto Show a couple of years ago, and uh, they really raised their profile. I mean they've been around for ten years, but you know no one had heard of them until really until the debut, and and since then they've been making you know getting lots lots of good investments and deals and lots of love. And I guess with the coronavirus situation, it's, you know, delays like this, I think, are inevitable. You know, it's, uh, there's a there's a, going to be a number of vehicles delayed. It's not just the Rivian. There's also, like, the Chevy, the Chevy Bolt refresh has been pushed back. Uh, any, any a number of other ones. Uh, anybody else have any thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah I, I actually, sorry, Tom. I, I, um, I disagree with Martin, actually. I think Rivian is... Oh. Um, we, we've shown, you know, I've got to play around with their concepts, which probably is why I feel like it's a little bit closer to reality than actual. Um, but they have the funding to get the project done. They have the backing from Ford, from Argo AI for their self-driving stuff. I, I actually think they're relatively close to being a legitimate production vehicle. The delay itself doesn't seem to bother me too much. Uh, R1S was always going to come. I think when I was speaking with them a few months ago in Texas, they wanted to get it four weeks after start of production. Just one month, R1S was going to come out. And, um, you know, look, if I would think they should just start with R1S and then do the T later. Uh, so we'll see what actually unfolds here. So, so I'd like to weigh, weigh in really quickly. Um, first, I'll jump on Kyle with this. No, no R1S first. We need electric pickup <laughs> trucks. Okay, I'm just going to beat down Kyle right there. Um, we we need electric pickup trucks, okay? Uh, of course, we need the R1S also, but pickup truck, pickup truck, pickup truck. So um, don't do anything, Rivian, to change that plan. Give us the pickup truck first. Uh, and Martin had mentioned earlier that you know, they had been kind of uh, around for about 10 years now. Uh, but you have to remember the first 
say half of their existence, they were planning on making a small sports car, electric sports car. It wasn't until they pivoted to the trucks, pickup truck and uh, the SUV that they really started to take off. And I think that was a, a brilliant move by the company because, like I said, pickup trucks, pickup trucks, pickup trucks. That's what people want. We buy about 3 million of them a year here in America. And, uh, you know, it's amazing that nobody's come out with one yet. And uh, I think that's part of the reason why they've gotten so much attention and people are so anxious to get this uh, because it's going to be the first all electric pickup truck that hits the market here in the US. And um, yeah, we don't we don't have that culture here in, in the UK or Europe either. Really, we have white big white vans. If you are a trade, if you're a tradie, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Australia, they have utes and we have white vans and you have trucks it's not a culture and if i i don't know the u.s market um well enough but what is it like the top three vehicles you know last month was something like the ford f-150 series and the ram and then something else like yeah. that's unthinkable here like we just don't have like, look trucks exist it's but not no just the trade people though here martin like people drive oh, really? their cars oh yeah oh like, yeah people, they're really people nice use pickup trucks as their vehicle as their their their, their daily driver they used to only fit like two or th- two or three people, but now in the last twenty years, they've added you know an extra set of doors, and they're like sedans with a big bed in the back now. Yeah, massaging seats, glass roof, <laughs> adaptive cruise control. They're great. They're like giant living rooms. Uh, Tom, no, I agree with the first electric pickup thing. I think I had heard somewhere, and I really want to do a little digging into this, that there were more orders for R one S than R one T by like a lot. Really? And so I don't know if that's true or not, but I. I guess I'm curious if the truck market is so large, why would more people order the SUV than the pickup? Uh, the, the only thing uh, that I would add, say to that, the possibility is that uh, a lot of the people that uh, say pickup trucks, maybe are 50, 50, half trades people, half people just driving them as their cars. Uh, whereas the SUVs, it's mostly all people just driving them as their cars. Um, the, maybe the trades folks aren't sold on it yet and they want to see other people driving them that, yeah, these can function as a, as a functioning vehicle for my business. So that might be why the initial, uh, orders are are a little bit lower for the pickup truck, but I, I fully think in the long run, they'll sell more of those than the R1S. Interesting. That's cool. There's also the point that the the R1T is not really, it's not really aimed at trades people. It's a, it's an adventure oriented truck mm-hmm. you know it's made for going on the weekends with your kayak or rock, rock climbing or, or whatever you know camping it's not really it's got such a small bed it could just a five five and a half or four and a half feet bed. yeah it's real short it, it's kind of small i mean in person it looks it looks not so bad but it you know you can't really throw a four, four bait should of plywood in the back and close the mm-hmm. tailgate that's that's not happening but uh man it's such a beautiful vehicle we showed the interior earlier. You were scrolling through some pictures of it here, and yeah, and in, in person, yeah, I would I would love to have one. Yeah. No, yeah. that's one of the best. It, it is so cool. I mean, I would drive an R one T or S every day, no question. I want one really bad. <laughs> right on. Okay, well, let's let's move along. The next thing we got some Tesla news, of course. Uh, so they're updating the. Uh, their Fremont factory to improve Model Y production. And this is because they're, they're shut down, at least to some extent, because of the coronavirus situation. Mm. Um, I think they're still making ventilators there, possibly they're working mm. on making ventilators there. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on inside the factory at the moment, but at least they are you know, fixing some things up to increase Model Y production. And uh, yeah, including, including actually some changes to the paint shop. So that might affect other vehicles as well. Hopefully, it'll improve the paint because, which is un- uneven. We hear at times. I mean, some people get <laughs> great cars, and other people you, you, you see complaints from time to time about the paint. It's the case for like every new paint shop, but Tesla is definitely on the lower end. But I just was looking at a Taycan, and you can see inconsistencies throughout. It almost felt like the car was painted and panel gaps on that thing. And I'm like a huge Porsche fan. I'm like, what are they doing? This doesn't oh, look very good. Really? Yep. Mm-hmm. Tom, you've seen a lot of t- Taycans. How, how, what was your? Well, you know, the cars that, that I had were press media cars, and okay. I think that Porsche would make sure that 
they uh, they 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 had the cars set up perfect. They curate for us. them. <laughs> so the the cars that I've driven uh, were were excellent. Everything was was really well. I had some wonky um, uh, software in the earliest version, the earliest one I drove back in September. Um, but that was the only issue that uh, that I could see on the cars that I've driven on the Taycans that I've driven. So. The uh, the Model Y production. I'm not even sure how we don't even know how many they're building at the moment. They they didn't break down the numbers, delivery numbers in their last uh, uh, delivery production numbers that they put out. So we don't even know. I mean, they're probably still ramping up, but um, see, we, now they're shipping them by performance. Usually they start with the best, the most most expensive models first, like the performance model and the long range. But I understand that. Uh, other people are getting vehicles like a lot sooner than normal. So I'm not sure if that's due with people canceling orders because you can expect because of the situation, a lot of people have to cancel their orders and that goes across all brands, of course. But uh, yeah, so we don't even know what kind of production is happening there at all. Any, any mm. thoughts on this, Martin? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting one because that, that reliable Tesla thing that we thought they would do, which is to start with performance and work their way down. We think that's all out of the window with the Y because it's, it seems that everybody who ordered one got the email before delivery started to say, now's the time to configure and now's the time to get your finance sorted. And then the seven seater, which is due to be next year. We saw a rumor earlier, maybe last week or so, which is that could be coming sooner as well. And, and we'll probably get on to, I don't know whether now, the, now is the time to mention the tow hitch or not, but there's been a whole saga around that as well. So that what we thought, even though Tesla's a new company, what we thought that they would do that they have done every time, they're not doing uh, this time. So like we don't, like, we just don't know what's going to come out of Fremont next. And as you mentioned, they're also uh, bundling their two sort of price points together, if you like. So when they, when we got the production and delivery numbers recently, they put S and X together and they put a three and Y together and they're not splitting those, those numbers out. And I can understand for good reasons as well. So there's no way of telling how many of those Ys have been produced. Oh, we can start doing you know, sort of VIN tracking and stuff like that. So they've kind of changed the rules on us this time and we don't know what's going to be coming next. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, maybe I'll talk about the, the tow hitch now or, or later as well. But all of these things are pretty fluid at the moment with the Model Y. We don't know what's what's going to be coming out of the factory next when the factory reopens, which is due to be beginning of May. Yeah, it's hard to say. But uh, I mean, when when they do start coming up, they'll have, as you say, a tow hitch. And Kyle came across this, I think, last night and threw it out there on Twitter. Uh, Want to tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So I had. Uh, seeing someone on Facebook like post about a tow hitch and then like a minute later I go in the configurator I'm like oh well this is kind of cool so it's a $1,000 factory option now available in performance and non-performance model Y um, that is a uh, 3,500 pound capacity tow hitch and this is something that we knew was coming because there's a cutout in the back bumper for a receiver, you know, it's the whole back end of the car is designed for a tow hitch. We did not expect it to come this soon. I mean, there was an article up on Inside EVs. I think Gustavo wrote it. It basically is like, why didn't they just put this at start of production if it's only 28 days after delivery? But now I'm thinking like start of production was like three months ago and they held the cars. So my guess is it just needed a few engineering changes, parts supply, who knows? Um, they should, I think they made the right call that it's not worth holding up production for a tow hitch. It's something that can be easily retrofitable in my opinion. Tesla hasn't confirmed. Um, but yeah, it's a really cool hitch. Great value. I'd say, um, 3,500 pounds is sweet. Um, you know, whether a thousand dollars is worth it or not, I don't know, but honestly you can spend two grand on paint, a thousand dollars for a tow hitch doesn't seem out of the, out of the realm here. Right. I mean, if you buy an aftermarket tow hitch, they're what, a couple hundred bucks and then the installation. Um, yeah, I think we paid like 600 to put it on one of our Model 3s. Okay, that's significant. Wow. I have one on, my, I have an old pickup truck and uh, I put one on there, but I was working for a parts company at the time. It cost me like a hundred bucks altogether. <laughs> but, 
So it's just going to be uh, the towing is going to be a big deal in the Nordic countries as well here in Europe. So the countries like Norway, uh, towing is a really, really big deal. And so it was unthinkable that the Model Y, at least one of the like, even like one of the variants of it, wouldn't be towing. And yet there's been this strange, I think, a strange saga. Uh, uh, back in January, we saw the spy pictures with the the tow hitch visible. And then in February, when the manual came out, uh, it was like, no, Model Y doesn't tow. Model Y doesn't tow. Then the car started to get deliver, delivered. And then those YouTube videos, those teardown videos hit the internet. And then there's the little cutout on the on the bumper. And it obviously just pops out. And then behind it, that would be where the hitch would nothing. go. <laughs> and then in April, it was Tesla uh, came out and said, that not towing. The, the Model Y will not tow. And then today... Hey guys, who wants a tow hitch? Like the whole thing seems, I don't know. It, it, it seems kind of amateur hour, if you ask me. Like just get the messaging right from the start. Like it's, it's, uh, Gus mentioned in, in the article. But Martin, I mean, that's Tesla. Uh, let's face it. <laughs> uh, unlike any other manufacturer, you, you just don't know what's going to happen next. And things change from week to week. I remember when I was about to order my Model 3, this was last year in the spring, uh, I was, it was in that period where like Tesla changed the, the, the cars, like what came with the car, what autopilot was, and, and, and whether it had home link. It was like every week there was a new thing. And I didn't know, should I wait another week? Or should I order it now? It was like it was like I was monitoring a stock and deciding when to buy. But that, that's Tesla. And, and as far as not giving us information on the tow hitch or giving us wrong information and then changing it, no other auto manufacturer operates like that. Uh, you know, any of the other auto manufacturers, if a car was about to come out, we could call, you know, being inside EVs, we could call their their, their press department. And they would give us a straight answer, and that would be it. It wouldn't be, well, we got to wait to see if somebody on YouTube posts something about the car. And then, but that's part of like Tesla's mystique, I guess. I, I, it's it's maddening for us in the in the media because we we can't figure out what's going on, and we can't convey that to our readers. But it's it's kind of part of what makes attracts people to Tesla, I guess. It's. It, it's bizarre, but that's how Tesla operates. And uh, I don't think they're going to change anytime soon because it's working for them. Right. And, and their communications department is, um, how do you say, not forthcoming. Communications department? They, <laughs> they have, have one, one apparently, time? yeah. Really? I mean, we used, to, we used to talk with them all the time, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. not so much. They're not, they haven't been responsive for some time I've, now. I've sent email after email. I can't even get them to respond. And I, I cover Tesla and I own a Tesla. So right. any of the other companies, if I send an email to press within a day, I get a I get a response with all the answers. But I mean that just comes with the territory. That's Tesla, right? So speaking of staying in with the Model Y for a second, let's skip down the list a little bit and just talk about really quickly the uh, the Monroe and Associates uh, teardown videos. There's been a, there's a series of them on on uh, Inside EVs now, and um, yeah, we're looking at and they're just tearing the thing apart. They've got they've got one in from. Uh, one delivered early, and it's performance model, I believe. It's performance model, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he's slowly tearing it apart and, and sharing what he finds and comparing it with the Model Three that he's taken apart previously. And uh, yeah, there's a number of things that uh, have improved, like the, the welds. Um, the last video I saw, I was showing the welds where the sides welded to the top piece in different parts. Um, now they're nice. One kind, nicely even spaced. One kind of weld. Where in the, on, the, on the Model Three that he has there, they had like squiggly laser welds, and then the spot well, it was like a mix of things. So that's that's improved, and the floor pans improved. Uh, and but the big thing was, I guess, was the, the the rear casting in the Model Three. They made the underneath the back behind the rear axle. It was like a I don't know, dozens of parts coming together to make that one that one shape. And now they have a one big aluminum cast piece with a with a drop-in plastic tub. That uh, yeah. So what do you, you think of that, uh, Kyle? Well, I think uh, first off, we need to talk about what uh, Monroe and Associates does, and they're uh, basically right. a teardown costing company. So they'll take a vehicle and then predict exactly how much it costs to produce 
every individual part and then for the entire whole of the vehicle. What's interesting in this case is it's really the first time we've seen the company. Uh, and, and by the way, that's not a unique position. I'd say Monroe's probably one of the best, but there's others that do similar work. Um, but what's unique here is they're being super forthcoming with a public audience. So they've started a YouTube channel. They're sharing their thoughts with Model Y. And I'm really trying to figure out the motivation for them uh, as to why they're doing this. I don't know, uh, but I think it is really cool. It's great for us who want to see the inside of Model Y and get some insight from a really long-term uh, industry expert when it comes to vehicle manufacturing. But um, it still kind of shocks me that they're being so open about everything. Now, granted, they're not going to sell you that book that tells you how much it costs to make everything. They'll sell that to another manufacturer for a couple hundred grand or something, maybe more. And, um, you know, that's that's where it is. But I, I think if we talk about the Model Y itself, the improvements are minor but plentiful. I think Tesla really took the time to learn from the mistakes on Model 3, which they then, you know, they with Model 3, they learned from Model S. So they're constantly improving. We're showing a really nice uh, trend towards optimization. I have been in the factory and seen the Model Y production line just recently, and it is way more optimized than Model 3. I think the whole process is only getting better. And as Sandy points out, that whole rear tub as one piece uh, plastic is so ingenious it's so smart and it means i want to take it out so i can put a camera down there and watch the motors move around when i drive um <laughs> it's one of the coolest uh, <laughs> pieces out there so i i'm a big fan of of their channel everything they're doing and again he's one of the best in the business yeah it's a great look behind the scenes like that um i don't i don't know why they're doing it uh maybe it's just like to help raise their profile maybe snag them more customers possibly if they have a more public profile but they don't really sell to the public so it, it's kind of a, a bit of a mystery there but you know like like everybody else i'm, I'm glad to see it it's really it's something we've i think no one's ever had the opportunity to kind of see this sort of uh, industry kind of behind the scenes situation uh, what do you think of it tom yeah, so I mean, uh, Sandy wants to be famous. <laughs> Why is he doing it? <laughs> everybody is has a little, you know, vanity in them. Every, every, everybody wants to uh, people to know who they are and and respect them. So Sandy's using the power of YouTube, and and he knows people are interested to raise his profile to to have people um, when they think about vehicle teardowns to just immediately think of Sandy Monroe. And he's doing a fantastic job at that. I love the videos. I love how he's um, pointing out how Tesla's improving, as Kyle mentioned. That's really the biggest thing that stood out to me. N nothing, Not any one specific thing that he's pointed out. It's just that I love when he walks around and then you see him get like giddy and excited. And he's like, oh, oh, oh look at this. Like, this is, oh my God. Oh, geez, I love this. Look, look what Tesla did here. So, <laughs> You know, like you could tell it's genuine unless he's like a really good actor. And if that's the case, he should be in Hollywood, not tearing apart cars because he really looks genuine when he's like stumbling on welds and connections and tubing for wiring and, and, and so forth and so on. So, you know, I mean, I, I mean, the guys, the guys got millions of views now. It's much must watch TV. Uh, we're not getting the detailed, um, you know, analysis of the vehicle. He's given us some real high level stuff. Just, oh, look at this bolt. Look at this. So yeah. I don't think he's, let's say, you know, given the milk for free. If you, if, if Tesla wants the, the report, they still got to buy the cow. But, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know if, uh, if there's any downside to what he's doing here. It's brilliant. It's got us talking about him and, when, when you think about vehicle teardowns, guys, who else are you going to think about from here on out? You know, it's just Monroe and Associates. You Great know, branding. Well, well played, Sandy. Well played. Yeah. Right. But I, but I would I would say though that he is um he does say in one of the early videos that he purposefully avoids any internet conversation, so he doesn't follow the topics of conversation, which is fine, which is fine. But the Model Three that he bought was one of the very early Model 3s. So mm. even by the time he was making the Model 3 videos, Tesla were able to yeah, say, oh, look, no, we changed that. So now what he's doing is he's comparing a Model Y. So again, first run Model Y, but he's comparing that to a first run, like first few, I think it was the first few thousand. Yeah, Model right. 3, 
And so he's able to go, wow, look at the difference. You know, 80 parts to make the back end of the three and like three parts to join the casing of the Y. Look how much they've come on. But of course, Tesla do running improvements all the time. So mm -hmm. there is a bit of a caveat with his stuff that he doesn't, he, like he prides himself in not following that whole conversation online. There's pros and cons to that because it gets a bit crazy. But he won't, he won't, he should have bought, if he wants to do this comparison, he should have bought a Model 3 today and a Model Y today and then compare and contrast because they won't be as different as the Model 3 that he's torn up in his shop. Well, I agree with that. That would be really cool for us to see. However, pretty much that wanted the Model Y, Model 3 costing breakdown and stuff from a business case for him, they've already purchased the books. So there's no <laughs> more uh, sense for him really to go in because he's not going to get, you know, a half a million dollars a book now for model three everyone who wanted one bought one and you can actually go and purchase sections so if you don't care about body construction you can purchase just the electronics component or just the motor design component from him and um i just think it from a pure business case doing that would be really cool but it probably cost them you know 150 dollars in labor time and and work maybe more just really for of small changes. I think the why is is really what we need to focus on, but I do agree. So so really quickly, we're running short on time. So I just want to hit a couple of notes real quickly. Um, so the, the the Berlin Gigafactory, it, we, there's one report saying it's delayed, but on the, at the same time, uh, Elon is tweeting that the Model Y for Europe will come out of there in a year's time. So, and that's, that's kind of fast. Like the Chinese Gigafactory went up in, in a year or something which is unheard of and there's a lot of doubts whether you can replicate that sort of speed in Europe but you know uh, as they say never bet against Elon and so that might be happening um, another other thing really quickly uh, Tesla related is the Model S and probably the Model X has a new launch mode so before if you're like the, at the drag strip and you wanted the stage it was like it was a little tricky he had just a few seconds to get it all right and then the, the lights had to light up at the right time now they simplified that but and they've also had a lot more power so we'll be looking for some uh some records to be broken and yeah the cool thing about it is that they have it has what, the cheetah stance so when you put it in launch mode now um the front end lowers it comes, comes, comes down and you're ready yeah. and you have the gas and the brake on at the same time and then you have like a good, I think it's like a 15 second window or something to, to launch. So that, that, we'll, we'll see some more records soon. It's like an extra 45 horsepower it's got. And yeah, so we'll yeah, it goes to 614 kilowatt now up from, I think, 575. Um, and the biggest thing, as uh, Dominic mentioned, is the uh, accuracy of a launch. So you throw the car into launch mode, two seconds, you're ready to go and then it shoots off. You no longer have to do this crazy dance that is really a pain in the butt. So so props to Tesla for upgrading their launch control system. It was really badly needed. And this whole cheetah stance thing, we've never seen anything like that in the industry. It's a really cool idea. You know, when I'll say, I guess with a, with a regular, uh, with a gas powered car, sometimes when you in launch mode, the whole thing will hunker down, but maybe that's a- The whole car will. Yeah, maybe that's a function of just the drivetrain kind of, all the tension points. Well, a lot of the cars now with launch control are the dual clutch systems, so they don't actually slip the clutch and put the, the stress on the drivetrain. It's more rev up and then slam it in. Uh, this car actually pulls the car down. And what would happen before is you would have the car basically sitting on that torque on the axles, lifting the front end up when you're stopped, and it would spin the front tires. So here you're able to get a little bit more weight up on those front tires and let them do more work. And uh, also they've, they've adjusted the Ludicrous Plus thermal limits. You can now run this thing, I think up to 55 degrees C before the limit was 52. That's a big difference between back-to-back -back quarter mile runs. And um, yeah, they're, they're really optimizing this chassis. Now, one last thing, because I know we want to move on, is all of the old record quarter mile zero to 60 times <laughs> on <laughs> P100D were done without sunroof or glass roof. They were done on slick top cars. That's no longer an option on the oh. current vehicles. So now they're heavier. Will that's maybe why we're not seeing them surpass the previous times? Just the theory. Yeah. Uh, you uh, before we I know we got to move on. You gutted that they've taken away um, the dyno mode, so you can't have your fun on track anymore. Uh, 
Kyle? That's right. Well, I mean, I'm lucky I have track, but I, I mean, I have a performance, so so I'm I'm okay. I, I actually never even really use dyno mode in my performance. But if you have a rear wheel drive, like there are enthusiasts who don't want an all wheel drive car or aren't going to spend $20,000 more for a performance. And here you are limited where you can't do anything with the car. Now there are workarounds. You can still pull a wheel speed sensor and turn everything off and you lose power steering and ABS. And that's, mm -hmm. if you just want to go out for some skids, that's fine. I used to do that all the time before dyno mode in, uh, in my rear wheel drive. But yeah, why would Tesla take away a feature that really no one used? If you were an idiot and crashed your car, well, that's your fault. I guess it's bad press. I understand it. But also like, Every other car has an ESP off switch. And so now we're enthusiasts are left out on this one. Right. I, I don't, yeah, I think it's it was for a very select number of people who would ever use it. And, and then the people who did use it, you know, crashed it, or at least one of them. And right. So, <laughs> yeah, but so, yeah, people crash on autopilot too. So like, it's not. That's true. Like, that's you, true. You know, you know they're not going to be 100% safe. At, at the end of the day, a consumer buys a product. I know I've, I, this is how I view, you should be able to do what you want with it. Now, I get Tesla can update software, that's on them, but I'm still going to be pulling wheel speed sensors and rear wheel drive cars and sending them sideways. So right. it, <laughs> they can't stop me from that. So sp speaking of sideways, can... sorry. Oh, wait, the video of Kyle. There we go. There's your, uh, there's your, drone, your drone video. That's right. so awesome. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's in uh, track mode version <laughs> two. And uh, this is the new section of our track here. We just finished paving it. And uh, basically, I can link the whole last half of the track. So it's essentially one mile straight of just full of that. And uh, it's pretty amazing how docile the car is in track mode version two, because it if you start to get a little too much rotation on, even though you have everything off, it breaks the front wheels a little bit. So it really makes mm. you into a hero driver if you don't have the skill to uh, handle a lot of this stuff. Now, you can still spin it out, but it's amazing. and. Um, they haven't mentioned anything, but track mode has changed with the newest updates as well. If they're refining it, it's getting better. I can feel differences driving the car. It's really cool. Did you notice that when you were doing your police car uh, comparison? Yeah, well, so that's an interesting one. Um, the police car comparison was more for fun. And then I wanted to do like a serious piece for inside EVs, which is like, here's the actual cost of using a police vehicle. Right. And I'm going to try to have that up next week. But um, the Model 3 when you leave everything on, because again, I didn't use track mode for the comparison itself, is a really like tame car. It pushes in the corners, it understeers. You can really put anyone in that car and get relatively close to the limits and it's not scary, it's easy. And Teslas have always been known for this. And so um, my initial impressions is I think a Model 3 or Y probably would be a great car for police. There are some concerns. A lot of people commented that they were worried about the electrical consumption of the components. That doesn't really scare me too much. The batteries are so big. I don't think that's gonna be a huge draw, um, but more so like the, the parts availability, the longevity, you're gonna be running this thing in the railroad tracks and the curves. Can Tesla's take that abuse and will there be a parts supply specific for police you know, to fix those things. Now, granted, they're not using body on frame vehicles anymore. They're using explorers and interceptors here in the US. Um, granted, the charger, I believe, is a body on frame, could be unibody. So I don't know, I, I, I think it won't work for every department, but I think uh, the technology is certainly there for, let's say, at least 30% to switch to electric and have a better experience. Right, doesn't, they don't have to turn the, the whole fleet into into Teslas, which would be maybe cost, cost prohibitive. I don't know. We have, we'll have to wait to see the yeah. cost breakdown. Yeah, and they blend is. anyway. Yeah, they right. always do a rolling upgrade. Right. Yeah, it would be interesting to see. Also, um, well, not just Tesla police vehicles, but like a Rivian pickup truck would make or SUV would make a great police vehicle oh, too. I think it'd be so good. Um. So. Yeah, and you also had the uh, really quickly you had the Range Rover uh, uh, plug-in hybrid, the P400e at your place uh, this past week. Yep. Yeah, so I got to spend the day with it. Um, I'm a Range Rover enthusiast, just general Land Rover enthusiast. I've owned them. I think they're great. I've committed to only driving electric, so I've been like out of the Land Rover thing for a while now. And so finally, the first full-size Range Rover was just delivered here on the East Coast that has a plug on it. They've been around in the UK for a while, so Martin, you've probably seen them, but we just got ours. 
So I popped down, took the car for the day, and uh, it is everything that I love about a Range Rover, but I can drive it in pure silence. They really did a good job on this thing. Uh, the only downside is after 20 miles, the little four cylinder turbo that they put in there kicks on and that is not so good. Um, it, it's just not powerful enough. It sounds awful. Like I was not a fan of that. So I would either prefer one of two scenarios with this car. One, they put the plug-in hybrid stuff with the big supercharged V8 so I can get noise and speed and great stuff there. Uh, no one would buy that by the way, or, or two, <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> you basically put a 125 kilowatt hour battery pack in this thing. Granted, the chassis is probably not designed for it, but in the next gen, and um, you make a full electric version, and that is going to be the Range Rover to have. Yeah, I think, uh, well, with Europe, Europe is electrifying very quickly now, and I think a, co a company like Range Rover really needs to look at going all electric like sooner than maybe they were thinking they had to. Um, yeah, I think so. we'll see it just within a couple of years. They're, they're probably going to design the next chassis to be a, a blend between internal combustion, uh, mild hybrid, plug-in, and electric to just accommodate everything. Right. Um, so it won't be a specific EV design. But look, they've done iPACE. That's a fantastic car. True. Drivetrain's amazing. They have the tech. Just put a little bit bigger battery in that thing because the Range Rover is never going to be that efficient and go for it. I, I, I will probably buy one if it's a legitimate, great electric car. Right. So the best of both worlds or the worst of both worlds for the plug-in hybrid? Depends on how you look at it. It's definitely a worse gas version and a worse electric version. But if you look at it as a total package, you're getting a Range Rover with a lot of adjustability, flexibility. And for nerds like me, there's a lot of technology. My mm. only hesitation is I would not want to own it out of warranty. There's a lot going on in no that way. Car. <laughs> too much to go wrong. Way too. Are the I don't know. Um, I don't know the stats between uh, UK and US and Europe and US, but like any kind of reasonable. So what was the the thirty one miles of range, uh, all electric range on? Yeah, that? that's just any so, DC. So in the so US, that's like, we're like twenty, but like, nineteen, probably like rated. twenty, like real well. But that would so for many commutes here. That would so plug in hybrids make some sense in countries where you've got you know, a shorter commute, but Tom, like what's the state of the, the plug-in market in the U S is it, are your commutes just too, does it just not make sense to have a plug-in hybrid to do? It's just going to be for like soccer practice on a Saturday morning. Like Tom, it, well, do plug-in hybrids suit the way that U S drivers use their cars? So, so it's a big, con that's a great question. It's a big country and there are pockets of the U S that, are well suited for plug-in hybrids, uh, especially the coasts, for instance. Um, but most of middle America, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you can get uh, over, say, 40 miles per charge. The small, uh, you know, 15, 20 mile pl range plug-in hybrids in, in the winter, they're getting 10, 12 miles of range. You know that the, you're barely, you know, on. The, you don't even make it to the the, the highway, and and the and the gas engines turned on. So while I, I'm a supporter of plug-in hybrids, uh, at least I think partially because they're a gateway drug to full electric, we really need to get the the ranges up to that 30, 40, 50 mile per charge for the U.S. At least the average American drives about 40 miles a day, and it would be great if the the all electric range could just cover say the average commute uh, to make it worthwhile. Otherwise it's, it's tough to make that economic, it's, it's, it's tough to make the argument for it if, if it's such a, a short range plug-in hybrid. That said, I have a friend that bought like the first generation plug-in Prius that got like 12 miles per charge. <laughs> and and he, he's had it now like eight or nine years or whatever. And like 90% of his driving is on battery. That's crazy because he works at home and from his house, he like runs errands down to the town center. It's like a mile away. So every time he leaves, he comes back, he plugs it back in and he's got like 70 or 80,000 miles. And he swears to me greater than 90% of his mileage is on battery, which, yeah, I guess it works for some people, but not the average American. That's interesting. Well, yeah, I uh, Sorry, uh, go ahead, Dominic. So we have like a huge uh, Clarity uh, plug-in hybrid community. The owners, the owners, uh, congregated on the Inside EVs forum. And uh, if you're ever looking for information about that car, 
go to the inside EVs form. Um, and a lot of our like like and that and that car is like amazing. You can get like 50 miles easy on a, on a charge. Um, but they're they're only, they're only selling them outside of California now on on request. Or it's a little Just bit the trickier. Just EV states, I believe. Right, it's a little trickier to get. Um, but we just had a guy post a picture. He got a hundred thousand miles on his, but because he's Ubering with it and uh, ride sharing, uh, he's running most of his miles are actually on gasoline, which I've, I haven't seen mm. in a plug-in from a plug-in owner before. Usually, they they you know they pride themselves on on only being you know uh, battery powered all the time. But this one mm. particular, but but it's, I guess it's held up for the most part, you know, because some people have concerns. Well. You know, like the, the electric, the electric drive train will hold up, of course. But if you only use the, uh, how, how, sometimes, sometimes in a plug-in hybrid, the uh, the engine will be a little undersized, like you were saying in that Range Rover, it's like a four-cylinder something. Yeah, um, it's a little weird. Right. Um, so speaking real quickly of plug-in hybrids, so the yeah they're going away for like a large part, uh, like GM they've. They uh, said goodbye to the Volt, and they made a point recently at their EV day, EV day of, of saying, you know, they, it's like for them, they were seeing it more of as like, why have two drivetrains in, in one car now? Because we can we can get, you know, 260 whatever miles like they do with the Bolt EV. Uh, so they, they've cut out plug-in hybrids altogether, and, and they're not doing them. And But still, like uh, other companies like Mazda, they have the MX-30, and they might... They have that MX-30 concept from the Japan Motor Show last last fall, and uh, we just heard that it's maybe coming to production with a Wankel engine range extender. That's right. You hear about this, Martin? Yeah, and I I kind of get it because they are invested in that rotary engine technology, and actually it's very similar. I mean, there was an Audi A1 about ten years ago that had this technology in, and it got it, you know it was a prototype, obviously. And then fast forward 10 years, and if you look in Japan, Nissan are doing good business with their e-power technology, which is the same thing. It's a, it's a range extender. I think the Nissan Note, over half of them in Japan are sold with the e-power technology. So the electric motors always drive the wheels, but there's no plug socket. And so my frustration with this is it's not particularly new technology. It's being sold as like, wow, we can use this little 250 something cc rotary engine. It can be a a range extender like wow guys look what we've done there's no plug socket on yeah. it you can't you can't charge Stupid. it on clean green fuel you have to put fossil fuels inside it it just seems like i don't know like some emperor's new clothes as it were like it's, it's kind of exciting it'll be efficient it'll do a job but they're so far behind with uh electrification and obviously they've got you know the connection with you know toyota and 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 that that passing of technology and knowledge but I don't know. It just seems like, okay, I mean, fine, go for it. But uh, it doesn't get me excited, no. No, I think um, Tom has a great way of looking at it, which is it's the gateway drug to a full electric vehicle. But it, let's say you're a Range Rover owner, right? You lease one every three years for this case. You can do it for Cayenne or BMW 3 Series. The plug-in hybrid is on par performance with like the six-cylinder. It is pretty much the same price when you factor in the tax credit because you still get a sizable tax credit on these cars. So you're gaining efficiency, technology, you're able to drive it in silence and you're not giving up any performance. Why wouldn't you just get the plug-in version if you're mm -hmm. already decided to get that car? Once you get that car, hopefully by the end of that lease, they'll have a full electric version that you can then graduate into. Because again, not everyone likes the current offering of electric vehicles. There's really no mm. true premium SUV, Range Rover quality on the market. E-tron comes close, but it's not as nice as a Rover on the inside. So if you're in that market, you cannot go electric yet. Even the e e EQX, e EQC, EQC. EQC. Yeah, it's not gonna be here for another year, I think. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Have you driven and that's that not going to be that nice. Yeah, yeah, I've driven the EQC on a couple of occasions. Uh, really enjoyed it. It uh, very responsive. Actually, handles really well. Drives more like a car to me than than than, than an SUV. It drove a lot better than the e-tron, in my opinion. The e-tron was kind of like a you know boxy SUV, leaned a lot in the turns. Whereas the uh, the EQC really uh, felt like you could really take the thing out and have some fun with it. 
Um, right. I, I, I really like the EQC, and I, I, I think uh, Mercedes um, was offering is, is going to be offering it at a decent price for what you get. So I was I was one of the people that were definitely disappointed that it's being delayed. And uh, I, you know, I, 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 I can't predict what the future is for the vehicle, but I thought it was a good package at a reasonable price. And it's unfortunate that it seems like Mercedes maybe doesn't have the battery supply to make as many of them as they originally had planned. And uh, they're allocating them more of them to Europe and whatever. But uh, I, I, I really, I was, I'm a fan of the EQC. I, I, I like it. All right. Well, on that note, maybe we should wrap things up. Yes. All right. All yeah, right. We've, we've, we've gone over our time. We've, we've, we've chatted too much. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, you can you can find Martin uh, on all the regular podcast platforms, including YouTube, uh, EV News Daily, and he's on Twitter as well. Uh, Kyle Connor, Out of Spec Motoring, uh, YouTube channel, and you can find him on you on twitter as well tom Logney, you can find him on the pages of inside evs and he's also on what's your twitter handle it's uh tom log t-o-m-m-o-l-o-g that's right and i'm um, <laughs> dominic Kioni, and you can find me on inside evs uh, inside EVs, evs forum and yeah y'all have a great week and we'll see you next time be safe Thanks, guys everyone. all right see ya